Hi guys and welcome to Tech Team BB. Since you enjoyed my Zen or Ryzen video so much, I thought I would do a video explaining the state of the CPU market at the moment, uh, especially Intel, AMD, ARM or RISC architecture CPUs, uh, as well as uh, the barrier to entry, so why it's so difficult to see a competitor uh, to Intel that isn't AMD, uh, and also the uh, just uh, the future of the CPU market and what we may or may not be uh, seeing in the coming months and perhaps even coming years. So I think I should start with possibly the most known brand in the CPU market, and that of course is Intel. They have multiple platforms, especially on the desktop side, which sort of carry over to the mobile type laptop side as well. Starting with Socket 1151, which is their more mainstream platform, and this also technically carries to the mobile platforms as well, but uh, on the mainstream desktop platform, you obviously have the Core series, so Core i3, i5, i7, and jokingly i9. Uh, and also you do have the uh, Pentium and Celeron names are brands, which are actually quite old. The uh, Pentium used to be the higher end, uh, type chip that you could get on stuff like uh, LGA775, but uh, nowadays that's the sort of lower end market. Socket 1151 has uh, a lot of chipsets to go with it and it scales from low to high end. On the lower end you have H110, I believe you also have B150 and Q150, you also have H170 and Q170, and then on the higher end you do have the Z170, and Gigabyte showed off this X170 motherboard, which was basically sort of semi-server, uh, but it does look to be you know specific to Gigabyte, so that one was quite interesting, but it does scale quite uh, massively over the low to high end. On the ultra high end, or for the enthusiast among us, we have Socket 2011-3. That generally uses the X99 uh, platform, also the older generation uses the X79 platform, uh, and you do have uh, a large suite of uh, chips available for it, at least uh, at the time of filming, where you have uh, both the current generation or 6 series, which is quite strange because they, they are the Broadwall E chips, which on the desktop 1150 markets were 5th generation, so there's a little bit of a switch there, but either way, you do have the uh, Broadwall E 6950X, which is their highest and 10 core. You also have the 6900K which is an 8 core, 16 threads. You also have 6850K and 6800K which are both 6 cores. Uh, the main difference between those are just the PCI lane amounts. You also have backwards compatibility with the 5960X which is the last generation Extreme Edition 8 core as well as the 5930K and the 5820K. In terms of market share, Intel is definitely the king here with 87.7% market share as of I believe 2015. Uh, in the CPU market, especially with the x86 CPU market. That's likely because Intel holds basically the me uh, monopoly on x86 patents, and if you want to build an x86 CPU, as I'll come on to later, uh, then you have to license that technology from Intel. AMD compared to Intel holds just 12.1% market share. This isn't massive at the moment, although hopefully with their Zen CPU launch that I'll talk a little bit more about later, uh, we will see this increase. I don't know if the market share number necessarily includes console sales for the Xbox One and PS4, which would add 72.33 million uh, sales to their number, but I do know that Intel, as far as I can see from my sources anyway, which you can check out in the link below, uh, Intel sold, I believe, 100 million units in quarter three of 2014 alone, which means that on average they are selling about 400 million CPUs a year, so adding uh, 70 million CPUs across the entire lifespan of the PlayStation 4 and the Xbox One might not make as big as a dent as you, uh, you might expect. Like Intel, AMD also has multiple platforms depending on where you sit on their user spectrum from the high end with the AM3+, Plus, lower end or medium with the FM2 Plus platform, and the AM1 platform for the low end. The AM3 Plus platform features uh, the FX series CPUs, which were famous for being quite hot, having low single threaded performance, in fact actually lower single threaded performance than the Phenom 2 X4 CPUs that the FX series were meant to replace, uh, but actually having really great multi-threaded performance. This was mostly due to the core design and the shared L2 cache as opposed to the more common shared L3 cache. Those also have shared L3 cache, but the way that the cores were designed were more likened to uh, basically hyper-threading as such. The way it works was having two effectively very small cores uh, or compute units uh, that were bundled together in a single module with the shared L2 cache between them. And then there was on the highest end FX 8150 and then 82 and 8350s, uh, they they all had four modules of two cores each, so that effectively, while you still did have uh, 
eight cores, it was more like having four cores, eight threads in terms of performance. Interestingly, AMD is actually being sued over their bulldozer architecture and the use of the shared floating point unit as well as the shared L2 cache. This suit was filed in 2015, so if you want to find out more information, I'll leave this document or at least a link to it in the description down below, which includes the case number at the top if you want to take a look. The main allegation is that because this uh, shares the floating point unit and the shared L2 cache, this cannot do eight concurrent operations uh, at any one time and therefore it cannot be called eight cores. It'll be interesting to see what this comes out to, although AMD has denied these allegations. Their FM2 platform was primarily for their APUs or accelerated processing units. These were uh, CPUs and GPUs on the same chip and it was quite a, a, an impressive feat at the time, especially with the amount of performance you could pull from one of those chips. Finally, you have the AM1 platform, which is uh, more targeted at the lower end user for stuff like digital signage, HTPC or media center type use, or simple you know, office workstation type use. They are actually very small chips. They're quite heat efficient overall, uh, but they're certainly not that great for gaming necessarily, especially considering that these are still APU chips. Chips. They still do have GPU uh, you know, components on board, but they are still quite limited. ARM is quite an interesting company. They're focused mostly on mobile chips. They actually have uh, about 95% market share in the mobile uh, phone market, which is actually really great market capitalization. They also have about 35% in the smart TV market, and overall about 10% market share in the mobile computing uh, sort of laptop type devices. These chips are based on the RISC architecture or reduced instruction set computing compared to the complex instruction set computing we're most used to with x86 type CPUs. This reduced instruction set uh, computing method basically simplifies the process of giving a CPU instructions and allows for a little bit extra performance while having very good power usage because you're using effectively less clock cycles per instruction. ARM CPUs use a load store architecture which actually is a very interesting way of dealing with memory. Now to simplify the, the idea, basically instead of having uh, something like a load, a add and then a store command for a simple computation just adding two numbers that are stored in registers, uh, in an ARM CPU you will just have that single add command and that add command will know to look in a certain register, load that value add it to the current uh, you know, program counter or uh, you know, one for, uh, a number from another register and then store it back in whatever register you've told it to do. And that's only one instruction, that's only one clock cycle you use as opposed to the three that you would need to use for the uh, you know, x86 type CPU. Since 2012, ARM have supported 64 bits computation and memory width, uh, which is actually really nice as Intel and AMD have an agreement on the x86 market uh, as AMD actually holds the patent for x86 64-bit CPUs. One of the really interesting things about ARM CPUs is that they can uh, work in a big little configuration where for example the Cortex-A17 can work with the other quad-core uh, Cortex-A7 uh, in a either a heterogeneous way where they all all eight cores will you know be working but obviously the A7 cores will be doing computation just a bit slower uh, or they can work in a sort of uh, full big little way where the uh, little A7 cores can be doing the background tasks and the general you know usage and then when you need the power of the a17 cores they can be effectively turned on and used for that high power uh, usage which is actually really awesome and is a very smart way to have lots of power avail available to you but pretty low power usage the way arm actually works is they don't manufacture their own chips arm holdings as a company uh, basically just holds the the patents and the designs for the cpus and then companies like samsung and qualcomm license them to them for what is a relatively low price compared to what Intel would be willing to offer for x86 CPUs, meaning that uh, you're able to see lots of these ARM chips uh, and people like Samsung will slightly modify them to their own needs. Uh, but generally speaking, you see stuff like Qualcomm Snapdragon uh, CPUs and, and that sort of thing. Uh, and you also ha uh, see Samsung's Exynos CPUs, which are all ARM based. I've had a few questions about why uh, there isn't a competitor other than Intel or AMD in the x86 CPU market. And while there's uh, a fairly simple answer, I thought I would uh, add this section in here just as uh, an explanation for anyone who's interested. The reason you don't see many other CPU makers on the market, especially in the x86 category, is that the first thing if you're trying to make an x86 CPU uh, is you would need a license from Intel. 
They currently hold all patents on x86 architecture, and then you would have to go over to AMD and get a 64-bit architecture patent as well, or license as well, which would cost you a lot of money, even if they would let you do it, um, especially because they already have an agreement between each other to not sue each other over their patents uh, so that they can use each other's technologies there, uh, which is a very interesting thing. And even if you can get those both of those licenses, which you would need if you wanted to compete in any meaningful manner, you would then have to go and deal with actually creating the mask itself. To give you context, AMD's Zen architecture took four years to develop, and Intel's 8080 mask, that took another, that took two years just to develop that, what is nowadays a relatively simple mask uh, for the silicon. So if you wanted to manufacture these things, you would need a very experienced, very knowledgeable, very professional team uh, of people, and it would still probably take you multiple years to develop, which is a very large cost unto itself. Once you've developed your mask and are ready to go to manufacturing, if you want to manufacture it yourself, I'll leave a link uh, to the uh, Wikipedia article that shows you the full list that it will take, uh, full list of steps that it takes to manufacture a silicon chip. So you can either go that route, which is very, very expensive, and you would need to hire many chemists and other scientists, uh, or you can go through someone like TSMC or Global Foundries, but even then, they cost a, a large amount of money if you want to get one of those chips manufactured. Uh, even just to get the contract you know, manufactured, you need to pay them a decent amount of money. And then on top of that, there's obviously the manufacturing cost per unit too. And then after you've done that, well, then you've got to uh, think about the issues of not having a motherboard to put your chip into. So you're gonna have to get motherboard manufacturers to not only uh, take on your uh, chip as a design, but you're also going to need to manufacture a chipset to go along with it, which is another chip you need to design and create a mask for. So once you've done that, uh, then you can go back to the motherboard manufacturers and get uh, them to work with you, except you're also gonna need to make sure that your chipset complies with all of the standards, including SATA, PCIe, and all that sort of stuff. So you need to go and do that work first. So I think you're probably starting to get an idea of uh, just how of how much of an expensive, painful, and tedious process it would be to try and compete on the x86 marketplace. Uh, and that is kind of the, the main problem at the moment, uh, where we only really have Intel and AMD as our x86 CPU providers. Uh, and if one of them isn't, you know, doing that well at any one point in time, then the other one is just going to com go complete monopoly mode. Uh, as we've potentially seen already, uh, where there's just not that much innovation per, uh, per sort of next step. Um, so hopefully I will uh, I look forward to seeing a bit of a shake up in the coming months as Zen comes out. Speaking of Zen, let's talk about the future releases. So this is where it gets interesting. I'm actually under NDA about Cabby Lake. I legally cannot talk about it. Uh, and if I did talk about it, I would uh, basically wake up at the core of the earth with a very sore bottom, uh, and that would only be the start of it. So uh, yeah, I don't want to get sued that far into the ground. Um, so let's talk in hypotheticals. Hypothetically, it could perform very similarly to the 6700K, especially clock for clock. Hypothetically, it could also be not that much different, especially on the sort of motherboard side of things. Hypothetically, I could be lying but um, I'm under NDA, so I can't tell you. You're just going to have to guess and look at the possibly already published reviews. AMD's Ryzen CPU, or at least the highest end one anyway, is going to be an 8-core 16-thread chip running at 3.4 gigahertz or higher. They haven't detailed the boost clocks yet. That's going to be detailed at launch, uh, and it's actually uh, quite interesting. Obviously, no shared L2 cache this time, unlike the Bulldozer architecture, and there's some very interesting features that they've announced already. Stuff like the neural net prediction is something that we already see in chips, uh, even Intel chips already, uh, but this looks to be a slight incremental improvement on that using statistical analysis to preload certain instructions into idle decoders ready for uh, when the actual instruction comes through so that you can reduce the time that the uh, CPU is fetching and loading instructions. So hopefully that will improve performance and it looks quite, uh, uh, very least promising anyway. I'm very much looking forward to this shaking up the market and I do certainly hope that Intel uh, will sort of uh, respond to this as such so that we can continue to have a sort of back and forth of Intel will release a faster chip and then AMD will be able to release a faster one and so on and so forth and especially so that we get a bit more market equality. AMD's R&D budget is at next to nothing in comparison to Intel's so for them to be able to produce a chip that is on par with Intel's is absolutely phenomenal and especially considering they also have 
a pretty great GPU division. That's just uh, pretty phenomenal. So that's pretty much it. Thank you for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it, found it useful and informative. Uh, please do share the video if you did enjoy it. Uh, I spent a lot of time writing, researching, editing, filming, and all that sort of stuff to make this video. So it'd be really uh, great if you could share it on Reddit or tech forums that you visit regularly or Gaming Tribe or anywhere else. Uh, it'd be uh, really appreciated if you do. Otherwise, feel free to subscribe and like and leave a comment. Let me know what you think of the state of the CPU market. Also, what CPU are you currently running? Otherwise, uh, feel free to follow me on Facebook and Twitter. I finally have an Overclockers UK affiliate link. So if you're in the UK and you purchase stuff from OCUK, please do click on this link before you buy your stuff. And otherwise, there is also, uh, as usual, uh, worldwide Amazon links down there too if you want to support me uh, and you buy stuff on Amazon. So uh, otherwise, uh, thanks for watching and we'll see you all in the next video.